Nama tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Nama tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Homage to him, the blessed one, worthy one, the fully enlightened one. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So what I was going to explain to you tonight is what the Buddha was teaching in reference to emptiness, the concept of emptiness, the idea of it. We know that later on after the Buddha was gone, Narkajuna pulled together the Buddha's teachings and he started a school of emptiness. But his idea of emptiness was not the same as the Buddha was teaching, or it could be that he was teaching precisely what the Buddha taught, and then it got tilted a little bit so that it's something that is different from what you're going to hear. But when we go back to the lesson that the Buddha taught about uh, voidness, we have two suttas, there's 121 and 122 in the Majjhima Nikaya. So tonight we're going to do 121. And um, what I was talking about uh, a minute ago, I can tell you later about at the end. If you remind me, I'll tell you what's happening um, with the idea of having the index project finally uh, put together well enough that it can be published. So we'll start this sutta. This is Najima Nikaya number 21, the Chula Shunyata Sutta, the shorter discourse on voidness. If you have the Majima Nikaya, it's on page 965 of B, the uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Thus have I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sawati in the Eastern Park in the palace of Himagara's mother. And then, when it was evening, the Venerable Ananda rose from meditation and he went to the Blessed One and after paying homage to him, he sat down at one side and he said to the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in the Sakyan country where there is the town of the Sakyans, named Nagarika. And there, Venerable Sir, I heard and learned this from the Blessed One's own lips. Now, Ananda, I often abide in voidness. Did I hear that correctly, Venerable Sir? Did I learn that correctly? attend to that correctly, remember that correctly. Certainly, Ananda, you heard that correctly, learned that correctly and attended to that correctly and remembered that correctly. As formerly, Ananda, so now too, I often abide in voidness. Ananda, just as the palace of Magara's mother is void of elephants, void of cattle, horses, and mares, void of gold and silver, void of the assembly of men and women, and there is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the Sangha of Bhikkhus, so too, a monk not attending to the perception of a village, not attending to the perception of people, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of forest. His mind enters into the perception of forest and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus 
where whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of a village. Those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of people, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of forest. He understands the field of perception is void of the perception of the village. This field of perception is void of the perception of people. There is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the forest. And thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that what is present thus, this is present. Thus, Ananda, this is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. So here we have a different idea about voidness or emptiness right in the very beginning. This goes further and it gets deeper, but we start here. You see, the palace of Megara's mother was not like any other palace. It was built expressly for the purpose of the monks to use as like a meditation center. That's what it was, a vihara and a meditation center. So therefore, this palace that was in the forest, it did not have present there any such thing as the men and women or the gold and silver that would normally be in a palace. It did not have mares or stallions or cattle or elephants. It did not have the people who would normally be working in the palace. You see the story behind the palace of Megara's mother. Megara was uh, someone who his daughter-in-law brought him to the Dhamma. I'm not going to tell you the whole story because we really don't have time. But he then called her his mother because she was his spiritual mother in tribute to her bringing him to the Dhamma and explaining the Dhamma to him. He built this palace in the forest for the monks. Therefore, it became known as the palace of Megara's mother. But in the palace, there were none of the noises and ruckus going on of horses and cattle and men and women bantering or gold and silver or cattle and elephants happening. It wasn't there. When he's talking to Ananda in the same way, he tells him, let me try to under, help you understand what my pure descent into voidness is. And he begins by talking about what is heard and surrounds you when you are in the city or in the village. And he says, basically, when you leave this sound and ex extraordinary energy around you, the vibration of the city, and you go to the forest, you are void of the town, void of the village. This is what he's saying. And then when you're in the forest, you are only attending to the perception of the forest, which is the next part. So you've taken the first step in your genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, we're at point section five. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of the people, not attending to the perception of the forest, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of earth. His mind enters into the perception of earth and 
acquires confidence, steadiness, resolution, just as a bull's hide becomes free from the folds when it is fully stretched with a hundred pegs, so too a monk not attending to any of the ridges and hollows of the earth or to the rivers and the ravines and the tracks of stumps and the thorns and the mountains and uneven places is attending to the singleness dependent on the perception of earth. His mind enters into that perception of earth and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be, dependent on the perception of people, those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the forest, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of earth. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of people. And this field of perception is void of the perception of the forest. And there is present only this voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of earth. And thus he regards it as void of what is not there. But as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus. This is present. And thus, Ananda, this too is his un genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. This part here brings back the memory at Damasuka, we, there's a large acreage that we have and trails were cut by me through the forest for walking. It was one of the things I spent time doing. And I used to climb from the bottom where the cooties were across the stream, through the woods, up the mountain to get to a high point where there was a cliff and some trees big trees, very big trees, and rocks, big boulders that I could sit on. And the one time I went up there, initially climbing up, I'm aware of the hills and the valleys and the uneven ground. I'm aware of every single sound that is happening in the forest. Forest isn't quiet, you know. People think the forest is so quiet, but if you tend to the forest, and stay there long, you begin to pick up all of the sounds of the forest. So climbing up and sitting and sitting very still, and this site was one of the first times that I had sat for about maybe two, two and a half hours. It was roughly about two and a half hours that I was there. But the thing was, everything fades away. There is no more concern for the trees around me. There is no more concern for the cliff and what's inside under the shelf. There is no more concern for the trail behind me or the trail in front of me or anything around me. I would still react and hear any movement in the brush because you become so sensitive. But in being very still, the only thing is to come down and ground yourself totally away from all sounds of any sort of traffic. We didn't have a lot of traffic at Damasuka. Five cars go in a day and five cars go out away from a dam, but there's no sound at all. And then what's there is the earth and small birds that you can still hear the birds and you can still hear squirrels if they're chirping. And then that goes away and there's nothing left but the earth itself. So settling into the earth is almost like an access doorway into going deeper in away from all sound and resting in a kind of equanimity. Again, Ananda, 
not attending to the perception of forest, not attending to the perception of earth, attends, the monk attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space. And his mind enters into the perception of the base of infinite space and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of forest, there are not present here. And whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of earth, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance and namely it is the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space. He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of the forest and this field of perception is void of the perception of earth. And there is present only this non voidness namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space. And thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus, this is present. This experience that you're having in the silence in infinite space is there. You can sit and as you lose the feeling of your body, in the fourth jhana, third, fourth jhana, then going into watching infinite space. And infinite space has a very light feeling and it's a moving away. Infinite space is a place that you can sit and observe each one of your jhanas. First, second, third, and the fourth jhana are the preceded are levels that you can eventually do determinations to sit in for longer periods of time once you have mastered going through. Infinite space is kind of really nice because there's you're not there. It's not a sense of you. It's the question of what is this vastness that's going in all directions around you, away from you, this feeling of incredible vastness and lightness. And how far can you see? If you have ever been at the sea and you have looked out upon the sea, you always see a horizon. But in infinite space, there is no horizon. And one sits there and simply stays without any sound, but still fully aware of what you are watching. And thus, Ananda, this too is a genderwine descent undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of earth, not attending to the perception of the base of infinite space, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. His mind enters into the perception of the base of infinite consciousness and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the earth, those are not present here. So this grounding feeling is gone, everything is gone. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space, those are not present here. You're just watching, just observing. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. So what happened? How did you get there? He understands this field of perception is void of the perception of earth. This field of perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite space. There is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness that is dependent on the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. 
So what happens is he's left the infinite space and where there was an expansion of mind with no disturbances at all coming into your mind, no hindrances, no arising distractions, because you're in a state of pure, pure observation. You witness the expansion, which is a feeling of empty feeling inside and watching the expansion, but then it stops and there can be a contraction. In my case, there was a contraction that happened where as much as it went out away from me, it just simply came back and went back, sort of like a into infinite consciousness. And thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present thus, this is present. And thus Ananda, this too is his genuine undistorted pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of the base of infinite space, not attending to the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, attends to the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. His mind enters into the perception of the base of nothingness and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. And he understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of infinite space or the base of infinite consciousness, those are not present here. And there is present only the amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. What do we do with the base of infinite consciousness? What can we learn from the base of infinite consciousness? If we're very still, and this is what is a little bit different uh, with some practices, when we close our eyes, people say, well, there's nothing there. Or if I close my eyes, I'll go to sleep. I should leave my eyes open. But in fact, if you close your eyes and allow yourself to watch, you do have a peripheral vision that is from the sides into here, just the way I do when I'm looking at you now. The question is, can you relax and smile to keep your sharpness of your mindfulness? Just keep smiling with these cheekbones, which are raising the corners of your mouth. Can you stay like that? as you're sitting so that as you go into infinite consciousness, if you're very quiet, they call it infinite consciousness because at that point you can watch consciousnesses arise. Well, how can that be Sister Kayla? If there's a neurologist present and they'd like to explain it more clearly than I'm going to explain it, feel free later. <laughs> okay, but my own way of looking at this is when you keep smiling, you sharpen your mindfulness, the sharpness of your mindfulness to be able to see inside. Now the speed of the brain, it doesn't stop and the rising of consciousness is spinning thousands of times, you see. How do we see these consciousnesses coming up and going down and coming up and going down? At first, they're like blinking lights in a state of infinite consciousness. They can be just like that, or they can feel like that you're watching in front of you, going across, da, 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 very fast. Or it can be a tapping on the body, or it can be a tiny, tiny, tiny sound in the ear. We've seen this also with students, okay? So what, it is that slows it down is you backing away and not wanting to personally see. And the further you back away and just watch, you begin to see the light go more, more like the description Bonte gives of a, um, an eight millimeter projector that used to blink, 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 blink when it was stuck, you know, and the film was going through, it would flicker on the screen. 
So you see these flickering and they're coming across because you have a peripheral vision inside. You have a big screen like going to the movies and it's black. Sometimes I have told students who are uh, not, they don't feel comfortable to sit and watch inside very patiently. Of course, we are a very impatient society who wants immediate gratification and immediate answers for everything. So it's understandable. But guys will come and they'll say, I can't do this. And I'll say, sit down, watch inside and pretend that I sent you to the movies and I gave you the ticket to go in, but I didn't tell you what's playing at the movies. I just said, go in and sit down and be still and just watch the screen. Sometimes they'll come back to me later because I'll forget to go back to them and they'll say, I'm still watching the screen. If something got there, I said, well now allow yourself to have Cinerama, more like a peripheral vision, a circular screen in front of you. If you do that, you can detect fairly easily the little lights might come up and down like this from the side, not just see them here, but see them from coming like this. And they're coming up, 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 and actually up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Yep. And it's like that little song. You know, it's going like that across the screen. What you're seeing is the arising of the consciousness and letting go, or rising and falling, arising, falling, rising, falling. You're seeing faster birth, death, birth, death, birth, death, but a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, a bit, that fast, but you're seeing it slower. The reason you're seeing it slower is because your mindfulness is moving faster and sharper at what it's watching. This is the only thing I can figure out. So we can watch them and then we can get teased by Bonte who will tell us watching them isn't enough. I want you to watch what happens down here before it pops up? What happens before it comes up? And then if you're an advanced student, he's gonna to say to you, and what happens before that? And you have to explain it to him. And these are the things we discover, what happens before a consciousness fires off. Actually, this whole thing is engineering 101, first year, with torque teaching you the pressure it takes to actually make a wheel turn or something in a cog and a wheel inside of an engine, how does it happen? And there's several things that happen in order for movement to happen anywhere in the universe, isn't there? So this is what's actually happening when consciousnesses arise inside us. And watching those can be fascinating and you just keep watching them. There is no diagnosis, there is no analysis, there is no examination why, no philosophical reasoning. Just watch. It's like asking you to be a cat, a watcher when you practice. And he understands that the field of perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite space now. The field of perception is void of the base of infinite space, infinite uh, the infinite consciousness. And there is present only this non-voidness, okay, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness. Now this nothingness he regards as void of the other two, okay? And he realizes that even though those are gone and they have fallen away, there is still this that is present. And the state of nothingness can be difficult for people today. People are not laid back as much today as perhaps they were in the time of the Buddha with farming and things and fewer people and less pressure in the world. But many of the problems and all of the dramas for human beings existed back then just like they do now. The thing about nothingness is you want there to be something there. So sitting in nothingness is sometimes a problem for people. So the solution, the 
the thing that I've said so often to people is the best solution for this is to consider it a challenge to explain to someone how to discover nothingness. And the way to do it is to pretend that you are an explorer and you're going to a place no one has been to before. And when you go there, you have to come back and tell us what exactly that was, but you can't be comparing it to anything else. You have to discover by just simply watching. And this is a dilemma because we live our life by comparing what happened in the past to what's happening in the present time or the present moment and color the present moment in terms of the past even if it's a short way back or long way back or prior lifetime or anything, it's always shadowing us, shading us. You can't seem to, it's very difficult for us and it doesn't happen very often that we're actually alive because we're only alive in the present time, the present time. This is present, even though he understands what is not present, he says this is present. Dasananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of the base of infinite consciousness, not attending to the perception of the base of nothingness, attends to the singleness that is dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception and his mind enters into the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception and he acquires confidence, steadiness and resolution. He understands what is not there, but let's talk about what is and isn't there for just a minute. This is a state described in the commentaries also as a sleep awake, sleeping awake, a, are you a sleep or are you awake state? And it even talks in the commentary about this state. The only way to examine the state is to come out of the state and then take a very little walk. And as you take your walk, you recollect what just happened because when you come out, you won't be sure, was I asleep or was I awake? But if you very quietly are communicating with your brain well, and your brain will tell you, well, there was this, there was a little bit of blue, and then you simply relax and let that go. You don't hold on to anything that happened in that state. It's important. At this point, you are basically in the eighth level or you're in the fourth, the, past the three mental states and into this state they call neither perception nor non-perception state. But you can recall what happened, that you saw a pattern or you saw a color or something occurred. And the moment you have that recollection, you let it go. What does this tell you about this path? It's telling you how important it is to let go, let go, let go, and go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper to get to the level where you can fall into Niroda. This level of neither perception or non-perception is the doorway. It's the gateway. The only way a person can fall into cessation, fall into Niroda from here, is to not try to do it and not be there at all. So it's a test of how much have you let go? How much have you gone away from this idea of I have to do this, I have to make it, I have to have it happen. There's a law, we set up a group of laws at one point, which I'll discuss another time. I might do it next week on Wednesday uh, or Saturday because they asked, uh, I'm sorry, Sunday, because they asked about this. And one of the laws is, if you want it, you cannot have it. So if you're pursuing it, you cannot get it. Why? 
Well, because the whole exercise is the absence of atta and the arising of anatta. And the anatta is the I, complete identification and embracing of the impersonal process that all of this is. In order to do that, I have to be left behind and the we just leave the, this is me, this is mine, this is myself behind us and say, none of this is me, none of this is mine, none of this is myself, none of this is who I am. I am witnessing a process. So mind's eye is witnessing in process. It is the knowing, as some people say, the knowing. He understands thus, Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the infinite consciousness, those are not present here. And whatever disturbances might be dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception. And this field of perception is void of the perception of the base of infinite consciousness. And it field is per, of perception is void of the perception of the base of nothingness. And there is present only this non-voidness, namely the singleness dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception. And thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands that which is present, thus this is present and thus Ananda. This too is his genuine, undisordered, pure descent into voidness. Again, Ananda a monk not attending to the perception of the base of nothingness, not attending to the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception, attends to the singleness dependent on the signless concentration of the mind. This is interesting. We call this quiet mind level. This is the level that whether you are practicing breath or whether you are practicing the Brahma Viharas, you will reach this last state where you are going to have as an object of meditation, quiet mind, because now you are going to be watching mind, watch mind. And this is the single signless concentration of mind only to see how it is working. His mind enters into the signless concentration of mind and acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of nothingness that those are not present here and whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life the sixth sense doors and they're talking about contact. It is only dependent on contact. If you were to touch me and I had lost my body completely, I would still be conscious of you in practicing this way where it is an aware jhana. He understands the field of perception is void of the perception of the base of nothingness. The field of perception is void of the base the perception, uh, void of the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception, and there is present only this non-voidness, namely that, that connected with the six bases that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. And thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains there, he understands which that which is present thus this is present and thus Ananda, this too is his genuine, undistorted, pure descent into voidness. 
what are we doing with the six sense doors there? What are we doing? We might have them just cross our mind. My sight is gone. Any concern of sound is completely gone and way distant, if at all, when it occurs. Far, far away. Any odor, very far away, very, very slight detect, can still be detected. He's saying this happens. Taste can still occur in the mouth, still occur in the mouth, but totally undisturbed. The equanimity is so high in this level of practice. The body is gone. There is no sense of anything. Unless you came over and said, you're needed to f on the phone, I could come out and go and if I was an emergency, and I could come back and drop in. See? Again, Ananda, a monk not attending to the perception of the base of nothingness, not attending to the perception of the base of neither perception or non-perception, attends to the singleness dependent on the signless concentration of mind. You are in cessation, falling in, in, into cessation. His mind enters into the signless concentration of mind, which is pure mind, still point, acquires confidence, steadiness, and resolution. He understands thus the signless concentration of mind is conditioned and volitionally produced. What does it mean volitionally produced? I have a clear understanding of the level in everything. So the letting go has produced this by not paying any attention to signs of any kind, no lights, no nimitta, no signs at all, no attention to anything. But whatever is conditioned and volitionally produced is impermanent and subject to cessation. The cessation state occurs with a beginning, a middle, and an end, just like any other state occurs. And when he knows and sees thus, his mind is liberated from the taint of sensual desire and from the taint of being and from the taint of ignorance. And when it is liberated, there comes the knowledge it is liberated. And he understands birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Now, depending on what the level of attainment is we're dealing with, the experience of this, is the level of liberation, which occurs in relativity to the attainment level or fruition. You're working towards the end of the birth of craving, but that starts with the end of the birth of reaction and the end of the birth of taking reactions and using them all the time and the end of clinging in your mind of all the stories why you don't like something when craving was, I don't like it, I don't want this anymore, I want to make it stop. And before that, the feeling was painful. You heal from this end. The ignorance is here, the aging and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair is here. From the point of the six sense doors making contact and contact producing a feeling and feeling 
producing craving dependent on the training of the mind. You see, Shakespeare said to be or not to be, that is the question. The Buddhist, he says, to crave and cling or not to crave and cling is a volitional choice you have. But craving, we know, will not be entirely eradicated until the level of an arahant and fruition. But was the Buddhist teaching about one Nibbana? Or was it about eight Nibbanas? It's an interesting question. How many times will you experience the cessation and then the turning on again and the experience of Nibbana. This is what we're looking at with what's happening with people who have this happen once, then again, then no more, or once and again, and maybe a third time or a fourth time, and then no more. And this is what is described similarly in the texts about the situation, who has completed the work, who has not completed the work. And when we talk about the, the teaching of the Buddha, was it one teaching, very clear, everyone understood it, and why did he need so many suttas then? Why? Hmm? There is no one sutta in the texts anywhere that will teach you all of the training to understand this whole thing. There are lists that appear, it's true, but you have to explain each part of the entire list that comes from other suttas and that is where those lists came from. Yeah, you have to remember that. And also, was it one straight teaching and everyone would understand at the same rate? No. Why? Well, it happens about the instructions and the terminology and whether it all fits together in order to make a tapestry of the Buddha Dhamma or whether it's broken apart like that and it doesn't fit together, it's not interwoven yet. It has to get, the terminology had to get to a place where it would all fit together and make a whole. Then we meet Ganika Mogalana in Sutta number 107, talking about how he trains the accountants. And then the Buddha talks to him about how he trains his monks. And he makes it very clear. There is a gradual teaching a gradual practice and a gradual progress. So what was he trying to reach? The cessation of suffering. So what would the meaning be of a gradual progress, gradual relief from the suffering? That's what it meant, not a big bang and here's the great tamale and we got it all in one bang. Nope, that wasn't it. Obviously it wasn't it because when we have descriptions of the camps where the Buddha was traveling and the teachers that were teaching the different groups, who were the groups? They were working to become Sotapanna. Another group was working to become Sotapanna and fruition, another to become Sakadagami, another to reach Sakadagami and fruition, another to reach the Anagami, and another the Anagami and fruition, another to reach the Arahat's level, and another for the Arahat and fruition. So we know these things don't happen together because there were eight groups described in the camps. So he understands
when we say birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done, there is no more coming to any state of being, we are obviously still talking about the stock statement for the arahat. However, we can understand that the birth of reactions are not happening anymore the way they were before. And these reactions that drive forth life at this time on our planet, where every time we make a decision to do anything to help the planet or the people or the group or the town or the city or the country, we base it on what we've done before so much, we don't seem to do much that's very new. So this is pulling from the past, driving the present, pushing into the future. And the Buddha is saying, learn how to communicate with your mind. Learn how to get to know your mind. And that's a large part of the teaching of the Buddha. Communication with our brain that we didn't know we could do before. In all aspects of our training, this is true. He understands thus, whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of sensual desire, those are not present here. And whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of being, or we can say tendencies to reaction, any dependent on the taint of your tendencies to reactions all the time. Those are not present here. Whatever disturbances there might be dependent on the taint of ignorance, those are not present here. There is present only this amount of disturbance, namely that connected with the six spaces that are dependent on this body and conditioned by life. He understands that they keep operating and he understands this field of perception is void of the taint of sensual desire. It is void of the taint of any reactions or of being pushing towards more reaction and more life after this life. The field of perception is void of the taint of ignorance. There is present only, and this is the one, this is what tells you what he's teaching about emptiness right here. There is present only this non-voidness, namely that connected with the six bases that are dependent on the body and conditioned by life. And thus he regards it as void of what is not there, but as to what remains, there he understands that which is present thus this is present thus ananda this is his genuine undistorted pure descent into voidness supreme and unsurpassed ananda whatever recluses and brahmins in the past entered upon and abided in pure supreme unsurpassed voidness all entered upon and abided in the same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will enter upon and abide in the pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness, all will enter upon and abide in the same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the present enter upon and abide in pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness, all enter upon and abide in the same pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. And therefore, Ananda, you should train thus. We will enter upon and abide in the pure, supreme, unsurpassed voidness. So what's the message here? You wonder what's the message here? The message is to let go. Let it 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 go. Because all it is, is pushing against the natural process of your existence, the natural process of your being. It's just an impersonal process. It was never meant to be threatening at all. 
We only have to remember we're not, we're not out of control. It's just that we didn't have the knowledge to understand how all of this works so that we could be in control in a different way of allowing, abandoning, relinquishing, letting go of anything that caused our mind to jump into the I mode and push and struggle and bring tension and stress into our life. That's the reality. And this is what the Blessed One said. And the Venerable Ananda was satisfied and blessed. He was satisfied and delighted with the Blessed One's words. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So let's all say our prayer. May suffering ones be suffering free, free. and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and magas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.